Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to today's uh, EIB GOBI joint webinar. Today we have two speakers. So our first speaker is uh, Dr. Jose Croza. Dr. Jose Croza uh, is a Uyghuri uh, national. He did his uh, bachelor uh, in Republica University of Uyghuri and a PhD at the University of Nebraska, Lincoln. Jose came to CIMED uh, as a postdoc fellow. In 1984, has been working in uh, CIMED. He has uh, many contributions, so as many of us already know, I know that's why many of you are joining today's webinar. So uh, to be assured, uh, Dr. Jose Croza was elected a best scientist of a CGIAR centers in 2008. He has contributed in many areas uh, in genotype by environment, QTL by environment interactions, general breeding and uh, experimental design, hybrids and heterotic uh, patterns, association mapping. Dr. Croza is a fellow of the Agronomy Society of America and of the Crop Science Society of America, also member of the Mexican Academy of Science, member of the National Research System of the National Council of Research and Technology. Dr. Croza is also a professor, uh, invited professor at the University of Mexico, University of Uyghur, and adjunct professor at the University of Nebraska. So Dr. Croza has over 370 scientific articles uh, in peer-reviewed journals, also more than 35 book chapters. So today, Dr. Croza is going to co-present uh, with Associate Research uh, Scientist, uh, Dr. Philomene uh, Juliana. So Dr. Philomene Juliana did her master's and PhD in plant breeding and genetics in Cornell University with Professor Mike Soros and came to submit as a postdoc. Currently, Dr. Uh, Juliana is working with uh, Dr. Robinson. Her key area is genomic selection and association mapping. Without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Croza and Dr. Juliana on their presentation multi-trade, multi-environment uh, prediction for wheat. Dr. Croza, please uh, take the floor. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me all right? Yes, very well. Okay. Yeah, I, I'll, uh, did you see my first slide? Yes. Yes. I'd like to present some of the similar, similar presentation I did in PAC in January. Uh, as you can see, we, you know, I am part of the biometric unit of CIMIT, and we work within CIMIT with the breeding programs and and, uh, and the agronomy and the biotechnology and uh, and genetic diversity, but also we work in collaboration with many universities in uh, internationally, like the Norway University of life science and the, the postgraduate in Mexico, Lincoln, Nebraska, the Colima University, Michigan State, University of Guadalajara and Wisconsin. And we have, and we usually have many, many people working with us or we work with them. So that, that is a, usually is a big collaboration we have. And I'd like to present some methods for genomic based multi multi environment prediction. The motivation of why multi multi environment is why to develop and implement genomic based multi multi environment. Well, what is the reason why? Because some women say, why you complicate life when already with one trade is complicated? But, uh, but I will tell you why, because the breeders want to have multi trade. They said uh, we don't want to have only one trade, we want multi trade. So I, I, will, I will show some models and methods. Jim Lab and Gaussian kernel, multi-environment, multi-trade multi-environment that we developed some years ago. 
and uh, and deep learning machine learning methodology that we've been we've been trying to incorporate to make our life easier in terms of uh, of of uh, of computing time and then some applications in real medicine with data why uh, why uh, multi tree multi environment you see the history of of genomic selection in Simic maze, although this is more with uh, seminar, but uh, we work with uh, maize and wheat in Simic. So, the in 2015, he shows clearly that uh, genomic selection works for 18 biparental populations. Those are the cycles, cycle like 0, 1, 2, 3, and you see that the average gain per cycle was 86 you know, kilograms per hectare per year. This is, Joseph was able to do three cycles in one year. Uh, in Me uh, That was in Africa. In Mexico, Shui Kai Sang, he shows that he can do multi-parental populations uh, with a very good uh, increase in cycle, you know, per year uh, of two to five you know, kilograms per cycle per year. And uh, so those are, those experiments were always, always based only on grain yield, no other trait, no other, uh, uh, no multi-trait. Also, uh, lately, uh, Joseph Ejene and uh, Manje Goda, they have tested in, in Africa about 500 hybrids from genomics, selected based on genomic selection, 500 hybrid uh, uh, selected based on lines from phenotypic selection. They put this experiment in the field with six commercial checks. So they compare the grain yield of the predicted uh, lines based on genomic selection with the predicted lines based on phenotypic selection. Well, the hybrid from, from lines genomic selected lines and phenotypic selected lines. And also, and also for managed drought and for optimal conditions. And you see that there is no difference on the selected lines as compared with the phenotypic line. That means that uh, they were able to predict 500 lines or lines for, that form 500 hybrids and they produce the same grain yield that lines and they are hybrids selected by phenotypic selection. That means that they could they could save money and resources by doing this uh, uh, by this genomic selection. And uh, the same or sim very similar experiment was done by by Shui Kai here in Mexico, where he has a lot of a total number of lines of almost seven thousand. A uh, number of lines in the training population, one uh, 2,000, about 2,000. In the predicted population, 5,000. He selected 500 lines and he compared maize, yellow, and white. And you see in the first graph, uh, white phenotypic selection lines, white genomic selection lines, they perform the same. Yellow phenotypic selection lines, yellow genomic selection lines, they perform the same. And when they compare both yellow and, and white phenotypic, yellow and white genomics, the grain yield observed was similar. The same for the top 10% line. So this is another, uh, another proof that uh, they can save money by not testing all the lines, but rather predicting some. The idea now, I guess, the idea of uh, Mike Olsen and breeders in Africa and Joseph and Manji just to increase the number of lines that were predicted based on genomics. Again, all this based on grain yield. No multi trait In wheat, after testing 50,000 wheat lines in Mexico and predict lies in South Asia, we found a genomic prediction of or correlation between between uh, uh, genomic values in Mexico to sites 
in South Asia. They have higher prediction accuracy than uh, those using phenotypic prediction. So that's, uh, that's again, this is a test that uh, says that the markers are good predictors and we can save time and um, money by doing more genomic prediction, not, not canceling phenotypic. That's, we don't think that this is the idea. The idea is just to improve the accuracy of the prediction by using genomics or by using pedigree as well. That's, that's, uh, this is what we do usually. But again, this is based on gradient. So, and also we can have, we've been using for, for the G by model, we've been using the GBLAB and the Gaussian kernel. Why the Gaussian kernel? Because the Gaussian kernel, has, as you can see, the GBLAB uses XX prime, which is a linear kernel, divided by P, which is the number of kernels. And uh, here, the, the GK is the Gaussian kernel, which is an exponential uh, of, of, of a distance between two lines based on markers, multiplied by an H, which is a bandwidth parameter. And it's, it's a parameter that controls how much and how value the metrics will have. And that is, we need to estimate this bandwidth parameter. And sometimes this is a, this is a little bit uh, computing intensity, but it always gives much better prediction of the Gaussian kernel than the GBLAB per se. And you can see, for example, in this clearly, the GBLAB in single environment, the increase in, in, uh, in genomic prediction values. Here in environment two, goes from 0 0.37 up to 0 0.422. This type of increase we expected for single environment as well as multi-environment. But again, grain yield only, not, not, not uh, multi -trade. So then in 2016 with uh, Oswald Montesinos, we, and, and, and Fernando here in, uh, in CIMI, we thought that uh, it might be a good idea to start thinking in a sort of multi-trade, multi-environment model. And this is what we have in this picture, multi-trade, multi-environment model. And this is the equation when we have a fixed effect of the sites and the fixed effect of Beta includes the trade by environment interaction. The random effect B1 has a trade by genotype random interaction. And the B2 includes the three-way trade by genotype by environment interaction that can be also used for, let's say, genotype by environment by management. And so this is a Bayesian multi-trade multi-environment. This is very... Uh, it's a very good model, gives a very good prediction, has the problem of being, of being a, a little bit slow in computing time. So these are the examples of the different traits in different, different traits in different uh, environments. There's two heading and DBI, yield and plant high, in environment one and in environment two. On the, right, uh, on the left hand side, we have the bit, uh, the vision multi multi environment with an structure. And on the bottom, we have the univariate. And you see that for many traits, for many traits, the vision multi multi environment increased the prediction accuracy because it exploits the correlation between the traits. Uh, this happens sometimes, sometimes no. And sometimes the univariate is better than the multivariate, but most of the time the multivariate capture this extra correlation between traits that we can exploit that for genomic purposes. The problem with the Bayesian multi trait multi environment is uh, is computing very intense. So we look for other uh, methodologies, uh, for example, artificial neural networks, because we have done some work in the previous years with uh, artificial neural network. And it gives a good good prediction accuracy. You know, artificial neural network they emulate what is happening on the brain, on the biological brain response. It's, it's a stimulus from uh, uh, sensory input, and uh, and uh, so 
we we have this and we we were able to then to the system will make a lot of transformation on the data transformations are are coming from the cell body to the axons and, and to the terminal axons. and you find so if you look at in b you you use uh, you have the input x1 x2 xn which are the molecular markers and the phenotypic data we do a transformation fx and we have the output this is a summary so we have an input so we have in the middle we have these uh, uh, layers which are inside before the output so you see that there is a, a lot of transformation because one cell join all the others at the same time so we have all these uh, sort of functions going on that will give us perhaps more power to capture some of the critical uh, marker by micro interactions that we cannot have in a model that uh, will have all this contrast because it's impossible to have millions of content so for a single trait an artificial neural network will look like this. We have the input at the bottom, then we uh, join each of the input to the next step, which is a, a, a hidden layer, we call hidden layer. And this is the input. And you see that the function here is nothing more than a regression using a weight and the weight measure how big is the stimulus from each of the input but the output of this initial layer is the input for what we call activation function that is another another transformation that we do on the on the output of the first layer to be the input of the activation function that will do another oh, sorry that will do another transformation and and uh, end up with the output or the prediction we have used this gonzalez 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 camacho and ornella that we have done with them we have done you know predictions for wheat uh, uh, rust and also for maize this is single trait. What do we do with multiple trait deep learning? Well, with the multiple trait, it's, it's a little bit more complicated, but we can do it in a similar manner. We have, instead of having one hidden layer, we have several hidden layers. And we do transformation on the data. We have the input, the X markers, or markers and phenotypic data. Then we use the weights to run these individual regressions to get the first output for the first hidden layer. The B sub 1J is the first hidden layer. So the output of the, of the initial input is the, uh, the input is the, uh, the output of the first hidden layer. The input is the, output, uh, the input for the first hidden layer. Sometimes it's confusing because now, now this input of the first hidden layer is the is the uh, gives an output which is the input for the second hidden layer, and the same between the second hidden layer and the output layer. So we do all this transformation, and uh, we need to define many hyperparameters because we don't know how many hidden layers we can use. We don't know how how many neurons or cells we are going to use on all these are complications that we need to find out basically by trial and error so this is again this is same as before but uh, put it as an equation where we have the initial the initial input and output for each of the unit at the first hidden layer then we we see that the b to 1j is the input of the second hidden layer and the same with the b2k which is the input of the output layer 
This is for two hidden lanes, but we might have three or four or five, depending on the complexity. But we need to have also activation functions. And the activation functions are very important because that will determine how do we put the train. And that's another, another thing that we need to define when we run the deep learning. When we use, for example, when we use Grainier, which is a linear, it's a continuous variable, we use this linear, which is called, the activation function is called rectified linear activation unit. And this is for continuous traits, like Grainier. How about for binary and ordinary variables, we might use what is called the sigmoid function. Sigmoid function is, 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 is statistically, we know what it is, and, uh, but, uh, but usually the machine learning people, they use another name, different than the, the one we use in the statistics. Then if we combine linear sigmoid and softmap, then we can have continuous binary and ordinary an ordinal data because this is what the breeder has. The breeder doesn't have only by right year, the year. The breeder has diseases as uh, ordinal data, as uh, uh, binary data, count data, you know, as different data that, that we try to put together for what we call multi trade. And uh, so this is the activation function. Then we need to define the hyperparameters in this deep learning. The hyperparameters are the number of units, the number of euros, 10, 500, 1,000, number of layers, one, two, three. Usually we have found that more than three are not, uh, have not improved by anything, but, but we need to, uh, you know, we need to do that. Then we need to define the number of epochs. How do we, how do we train? How do we tune up the model? Then the type of regularization method, then the type of activation function. So we need to define this at the moment because we don't know how to do it really, except for trial and, and error. We say, well, let's start for, with 10 up to 500 and let's start with two or three uh, um, hidden layers and uh, let's use activation function depending on the trade that we are having. So we do this based not in a very formal manner. So that, uh, so this is more or less the idea that, uh, that you might have when you do this deep learning. This is one example that is a genomic prediction of a single continuous trait using deep, deep learning. This is one, only one trait we use with and without G by E. And we have the G black, which is the green, and the deep learning, which is the red one. And we have the data, maze one, two, three data set, uh, with four, five, six, seven, eight data set. And we have uh, one this, and we have one data set from Iranian wheat that we, so uh, those are Iranian land races, wheat Iranian land races. So you see that in general, these are the, the correlations between the testing and the training, the testing and the observer. You see when there is G by E, usually the G lab is superior than the deep learning prediction. When we, we, when we ignore J, G by E in the model, usually the deep learning is superior in many data sets is superior than the G black. We believe that the deep learning, when we put the G by E, the deep learning will overfit the, the deep learning because the deep learning doesn't seem to need to have explicitly in the model G by E, the deep learning will take into account the G by E without putting it in the model. This is what we are thinking. But, but you see that when there is a G by E, as it is, we have that the G lab is better than the deep learning. This is for continuous. Now we, 
in this particular uh, example, you have multi thread So we use multi thread continuous multi thread And this is the comparison between deep learning in the green and Bayesian multi trade multi environment in red. You see, when we have G by E, Bayesian multi trade multi environment is superior than the, than, the, uh, than the deep learning. When we have no G by E, uh, the multi trade multi environment is superior than the Bayesian multi trade multi environment. Also, we said what happens if we have binary, ordinary, and continuous phenotypes. We have a multi trait deep learning with mixed phenotype because we have mixed traits. And we have the univariate deep learning with only one trait. You see that uh, for grain yield, there is a slight increase in prediction accuracy when we, when we use multi trait deep learning as compared with univariate, but not for logging. For logging, gives similar, similar results. So we need to do further research for including counting data. So the conclusions that we, we have are the Bayesian multi multi-manual gives the best accuracy in prediction, but computationally intense and slow. We need to have new and faster algorithms that uh, have been developed for Bayesian multi multi environment. This is something that we have already published, this, but still under a lot of Data still the Bayesian multi environment is slow. Single continuous, single continuous trade deep learning model without G by E has higher prediction accuracy than G plus. Multi trade continuous deep learning model without G by E has higher prediction accuracy than the multi trade multi environment. But, uh, but uh, it's also computational much more efficient than multi trade multi environment. Multi trade deep learning has higher genomic prediction than single trait. This is most of the time we find it. Most of the time we find that multi, uh, multi trait deep learning is better than single trait deep learning. And then we have this mixed trait, binary order and continuous, can be handled very efficiently with deep learning multi trait. But we need to have an appropriate activation function. Uh, we need to do more research to find a more formal methodology for defining the hyperparameter because now we are just blindly saying let's use this and it's that. Finally, after doing all this reading and research for for more than more than a year and a half, we see that several deep and single neural network models are just no different than a non-linear generalized model that we use in statistics. So we are talking the same language as the machine learning with the advantage of the machine learning researchers that they know a lot of computing that sometimes we don't know in the statistics, but we are learning more on that. With this, I think I say thank you very much to different found, founding agency. We have a, a, a project with the Norway guys. Uh, we use Several Melinda, Bill and Melinda Gates data from Cornell and Kansas University, CRP, Mason with Massaro, Mexican federal government, and of course, USAID. Thank you very much. If you have any questions later. Hey, good morning, everybody. Um, so today I'll talk about a little bit about our work with Dr. Prasa and the Red Wheat waiting team here, and some of the main um, themes of my talk today will be how we have evaluated genomic selection in the grading program at CIMIT, and some questions like what is the genomic predictability of grain yield, and can we reduce a year of yield testing using genomic selection? So currently we have about three years of yield testing here at Obregon before the international nurseries are sent out, so can we reduce a year of that using GS? And then can we substitute replications of yield testing using genomic selection? So instead of having three replications, can we substitute some of them for um, using GS? And then how does the genetic relatedness between the lines contribute to the prediction accuracy? So what are the best training sets? What are the best populations for, improving, for getting better prediction accuracies? And what does high throughput phenotyping data 
do? Can we increase prediction accuracies by integrating HTTP data? And overall, what is the most cost-effective prediction strategy? And um, can we predict the grain yield of lions in South Asia using their performance in Obregon? How does indirect selection or indirect prediction help, help us? And um, so apart from grain yield, what are the genomic predictabilities of other different traits like diseases and quality? And what have we done with respect to scaling up selections to earlier generations using genomic selection? So a quick overview of um, our of our evaluation stages. So once the lines are fixed, so once we have the head rows, the next stage is a yield testing stage where we have about 9,000 lines and data for grain yield, agronomic traits, and stem rust. And then the second year of yield trials where we have about 1,092 lines. And these are evaluated in six environments in Oregon for grain yield in um, irrigated optimum environments in bed and flat planting systems and also in two um, types of uh, drought and two uh, heat stress environments. And then we also have data for disease and quality. And then we move on to the advanced elite yield trial stages where we have about 280 lines that are selected from the previous stage. And these are evaluated in three simulated environments, just one irrigated, one drought, and one heat stress environment. And simultaneously, a set of 500 lines go to South Asia. This is part of the USAID project. And these go to locations in India, Bangladesh, and Pakistan. So five different locations, three in India, one in Bangladesh, and one in Pakistan. So these lines are simultaneously evaluated there. And then based on all these evaluations, um, Simit sends out the international nurseries, which are the SWITs, SAWITs, and high temperature wheat yield files. So 50 lines going into these three international nurseries based on uh, the yield testing and other um, phenotyping data from the other um, traits as well for the past three years. And so far for the past five years, all of our uh, yield testing lines have been genotyped by Jesse Pollan from Kansas State, and this is part of the USAID Feed the Future project and also the Delivering Genetic Aid and Beat project. And this graph shows the diversity in our germplasm. So this is showing about um, 38,000 lines. Uh, for which we have the genotyping data. And in 38,000 lines, you can expect about 6,600 crosses. So each dot here, each color here, represents a single a cross and a progeny from that cross. So there are so many different crosses made every year, and there is this huge diversity uh, in our germplasm as well. And so moving on to our results. So what happens uh, when we try to predict grain yield within panels using cross-validations and across panels um, by using about, so you can see in the bottom here that there are about 766 to 980 lines predicted from using 2,500 to 2,700 lines. So about three times the training populations, um, you have, you predict lines, um, about 700 to 900 lines using lines that are three times um, in the training population, bigger in the training population. So as you can clearly see, the contrast between these two prediction accuracies. The within panel cross validations, the five fold cross validations are usually higher, give you higher accuracies for grain yield in the different stressed environments and the irrigated environments versus across panel prediction accuracies, which drop down to 0.2 to 0.3 usually. And that brings us to the question are historic training populations ideal for predicting grain yield? And um, it's it doesn't, um, what we found out, but actually a lot of work that Dr. Krasa has done also, even if you have about 50,000 lines in the training population, um, if you have a lot of effect of years, then um, no matter how big the training populations are, the predictabilities are still going to be around 0.3 or 0.4. And um, that's a question, the next question we had, uh, will increasing the size of training populations result in better prediction accuracies? So as long as your LDDKs, so the QTL are no longer an LD with the causal uh, trait because of the effect of the years or the environments across um, the testing sites, then um, prediction across different panels is still going to be a challenge. And so we have this question, like, is G by E the main reason that is leading to poor prediction accuracies across years? So what we did is we just estimated the variance components and heritabilities across three years of yield testing in Obregon. 
So we see the YTs, the first year, the EYTs, the second year, the AEYTs, the third year of field testing. And there are about 1,000 lines that are common between the first and second years, and about 280 lines common between the second and the third years. And you can see different environments here, combinations of different environments here. And in this table, what we see very clearly is that it's not the genetic variance, it is not the G by E as well, but it's a year. The huge component of differences uh, across all these trials is just the year effect. So each year of evaluation of Obregon is so different. So the year itself is contributing to 40 to 50 percent of the variance. And then we also have um, G by Y, and which is about five to 17 percent. So it's not as huge as we expected. But then um, there's a sizable portion of error as well. But the heritability across years is going to be about 0.3. And this is the reason why our prediction accuracy is also close to 0.3. And very rarely you can exceed 0.3 or 0.4 just because that's the amount of uh, genetic variance that can be predicted. The rest is due to the environment, due to the years. And um, that brings us to the conclusion that prediction of unknown future years is still a challenge unless a future year has very similar climatic conditions to a year in the training set. So if there's a year that is very similar to something in the training set, then they can expect better prediction accuracies. But with changing years um, and predictions across years will be a challenge. The next question was, can we reduce um, to, uh, a year of yield testing in Obregon using genomic selection? So here we see um, different years. So YTs and EYTs, as I mentioned, the first and second year, YTs and AEYTs, the first and third year. And what I've shown here are the phenotypic correlations, the genetic correlations between years, and prediction accuracy using a baseline model. Here, the baseline model is just a model with the environment and genotype effects. And a G by E model here is something with the environment, the G matrix, and then we have the G by E interactions as well. And if we predict, what happens if we predict the same lines in a different year? So these are not different genotypes across different years, but the same genotypes across different years. And as we can see, there's a very marginal increase by using the G by E model, but um, the baseline model, because the main effect here is still the years, uh, the variance component here the years. So there's not a good advantage you might get by using a G by E, G by e model uh, for skipping a year of field testing. And to a breeding program um, like CIMET, this is um, important because um, the objective here is to do a wide testing for grain yield in several different environments so that the lines that come out, the 50 lines that I've shown before, are widely adapted to several different climatic conditions and are climate resilient. So we are not predicting for any specific environment, but we're looking at the performance of the genotype across different environments. So in that case, um, gen genomic predictions might not be a substitute for phenotyping in an additional unknown environment. But in cases, if we know the environment that we're predicting for so well, and it's a constant environment, in those cases, genomic selection can be very useful. The next question was, can we substitute a replication of yield testing using genomic selection? So uh, we did this. So we looked at the um, six different um, environments in EYTs, and this is just showing the data from one cycle. And what I'm showing here is a cross-validation prediction accuracies using the G matrix and the cross-validation accuracies using pedigree. So as you can see here across all the six different environments, the pedigree performs uh, very similar to the markers. And this has been shown by Dr. Krasta even 10 years ago that the pedigree, at least in cement germplasm, the pedigree is as good as the markers. So if you want to substitute a replication, it's still worth to do it using the pedigree because there's not much difference. And the reason for this is, the main reason why the pedigree is as good as the markers is because of the family sizes in our populations. So once you come down to the second year of field testing, there are barely three to uh, two or three SIPs per cross. And what I'm showing here is a variance among the full SIPs for grain yield. And as you can see in some crosses, the x-axis, we have different crosses, and, the, and you can see in some crosses, there's very little variance for grain yields among the progeny. So if that's the case, then the pedigree should perform as well as, the, as good as the markers are. So uh, what we, the lesson that we learned from here is very important to investigate family structures in populations before um, implementing GS, and in cases where there are 
few progenies across as some pro breeding programs might end up in later in ad advanced generations because um, you don't want to keep several sister lines, but you also need diversity. So in that case, it might be just cost effective to just use the pedigree. And then another question, how can we improve prediction accuracies for grain yield? So now we have seen uh, different um, scenarios with the environment and pedigree. And the question here was, how does genetic relatedness between the lines contribute to prediction accuracies? And as you can see here, these are four different uh, second aerial testing lines. And these are two different environments, drought stress and late stress, uh, late stone heat stress environments. And uh, what I'm showing here is a cross validation with lines that have only one progeny per cross. And on the right side, you can see a prediction of 50% of full sips from the other 50%. So if you have like let's say four full sips in the uh, in the population, you can have two of them in your training and two of them in the validation. And as you can see here very clearly, the accuracies and genomic predictions, as we all know and should expect, is clearly coming from relatedness. So if you have full sips in the training population, the accuracies go much higher than having completely unrelated lines in the population. So the question here is how do we optimize our training populations to have a good amount of relatedness to be able to predict and what do we do with, because diversity is a big, um, uh, is a key component in cement germplasm. There are several crosses that might just end up with one individual per cross. So 50% of our lines may just have one individual per cross. And how do we predict them well using genomic predictions is a key question. So, in, and in selected lead populations with limited phenotypic variance among the full SIPs, the pedigree is still good as you can see on the right hand side. The genomic and the pedigree perform very similar. So again, the pedigree beats our genomic predictions in our case. And the next question is how does high throughput phenotyping data increase prediction accuracies or what is the most cost effective prediction strategies? So we have data from aircrafts, um, manned aircrafts, and this is just showing one gear, two different environments, and genetic correlations of NDVI with yield is pretty high, it's 0.49, and in the other case, it was about 0.59 at the vegetative and grain filling stages. And we try to use um, different strategies. So what happens when you just use the genomic relationships, when you just use pedigree, then you use a combination of genomic and pedigree, then you just use GNDVI, then we just use genomics and GNDVI, and then pedigree and GNDVI. As we can see, there's not a big difference among all these different um, strategies for prediction. Um, you're still as good as using GNDVI because it's direct, uh, it's also uh, indirect um, uh, selection for grain yield. So you can, um, the cheapest strategy among all these different ones will be just combining pedigree, which is free of cost, as well as GNDVI, which can still give you um, good prediction accuracies. And uh, the next question was, can we predict the grain yield of lines in South Asian sites using their performance in Opticon? So Dr. Praza has already, already shown you how 50,000 lines were used as a training population to predict the lines in South Asia. But now I'm going to be showing a very smaller case here. How do the same 500 lines, how do they perform in Obregon? And how um, can we use the data from their performance in Obregon to predict grain yield in Jabalpur? So as you can see here, there are four different um, um, statistics in the x-axis for four different environments. So we have two irrigations, five irrigations, flat five irrigations, and flat drip. And there are the genetic phenotypic correlations in all these different environments between this particular Obregon environment and Jabalpur. And then we have the prediction accuracy using the baseline model with just the environment, and the prediction accuracy using the GYE model. So if it's the same set of lines, again, we come to the same conclusion as um, I showed before. The GYE model might not be very superior to the baseline model because, again, the year is the biggest um, component of variation across these lines, which is which I'm showing here in this slide. So we have the Obregon environment on the uh, left-hand side, two different environments here, and all the four uh, different sites in South Asia. And as you can see, the biggest component of variance here is the environmental variance, and here it's a component. The environmental variance is a combination of both location and year. So the lines in Obregon uh, are, the lines are selected from Obregon and they're evaluated in, in, in India and Pakistan in the next year. So the combination of location and years, and as you can see, the variance of the environments, again, four to six times the additive genetic variance. And that's why the baseline model might perform as well as the GYE model. 
And the last question we have is, what are the genomic predictabilities of different traits? So in this graph, you can see all the predictable, all the traits that we evaluate in the second year of yield trials. So we have all the different quality traits, um, followed by grain yield and different environments, heading, maturity, and then a bunch of different diseases, seedling and field resistance. And as you can see, there are some traits which are really predicted well, as expected. For example, the, mo the, well, the most well predicted trait is grain color, just because of the simple nature of the trait. And then stem rust seedling resistance, as you can see here, it's 0.82, again, because of the simple nature of the trait. But there are several traits like thousand kernel weight, albiograph, and flower protein, which are quite complex, I would say, but still we have very good predictabilities um, using genomic selection. So these are the traits which we can go after, the quality traits, which are quite stable across years, and we also get good prediction accuracies, as well as stem rust in the field. So our stem rust evaluations are done in Enduro, Kenya. And as you can see, you have a 0.64 prediction accuracy for stem rust in the field, which is also very promising. And this slide is about um, genomic predictions using historic training sets. So now we have about four to five different year, uh, four to five years of training sets for most of these traits. So what happens if we use historic training sets to predict a specific year? And here we can see the average of those accuracies. And as you can see again, some of the quality traits are well predicted using historic training sets. And you can see alveograph, like you have a um, predictability of 0.67. And then even some of the seedling stem rust diseases, as well as field stem rust disease, uh, field stem rust, which is, has a predictability of 0.6 again. But as you can see, grain yield, because of all the factors that I've mentioned previously, has a very low predictability when we use historic training sets. So um, this just tells us that there are cases where genomic selection might help. And there are some traits which are suddenly challenging for genomic selection. And the last part of my presentation today is showing you how we use genomic selection in the um, in Simmons Speed Brain program. So what we have done is we've used data from the training population that I mentioned before. We have about 3,500 lines that comprise this training population from the second year of yield trials for the past four years. And we have used that to scale up selections to the previous generation in the YTs, where most of these traits are um, not evaluated, so you don't have septoria data. So we don't screen all the 10,000 lines or 8,000 lines in the YTs for septoria. So we could scale up predictions to previous generations. And the last year, we have done these predictions. And the breeder had all these predictions when he made his selections. And when we saw the 1,000 lines that were selected and the correlations between the predicted ones for the 10,000 versus the real 1,000 lines that made it to the next year, the correlations were pretty high. For example, for stem rust, as you can see, the correlations in one of the seasons was close to 0.6. So this is completely, um, you're predicting lines that are completely not phenotyped. 10,000 lines where only 1,000 of them are phenotyped in the next year. So this has helped the breeders to select, um, to have information of these traits while making their selections. And we have also done this for quality last year where we have very high prediction. Um, we had very high uh, accuracies um, when we um, correlated them with the true uh, phenotypic values the next year. So you can see some of the traits like albiograph, they're still high, the, the prediction accuracy is about 0.6. Um, so with that, that's all I had for today. And uh, um, this work has been done with excessive funding from the Gates Foundation, USAID, DFID, the BGRI, and we also thank Cornell and Kansas, Jesse Poland from Kansas for all the collaborations um, and um, work that went into this research. Thank you very much. And with this, we can take any questions for Dr. Graza and I. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Philemon and also Jose. So now the floor is open for questions and comments, clarifications. So you are already unmuted if you have any questions. Okay, Dr. Uh, Krosa, uh, could you bring up your presentation again? I have one question. Yeah. You are opening. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So uh, 
not very familiar with a deep learning, so maybe just a very basic question. So could you bring to the slides uh, closer to the, uh, uh, the results? Uh, yeah, the results part, yes, yeah, somewhere here. Uh, so maybe the summary slides, then uh, we can visit uh, the result. So my question is, uh, in terms of performance, the deep learning is a lot faster than the traditional uh, genomic prediction, right? That's my understanding. So I'm wondering uh, what kind of a scale in terms of the performance better than traditional G-Blob? Yes, uh, that's a good question. We, we didn't quantify that exactly, but it's faster than the Bayesian multi limit environment. That's no question about it. And uh, I would say, depending on the data and the number of trades, maybe 10 times faster. Uh, now, not, not only faster, but perhaps easy for implementing, except for the reality that we need to tune the model and tune the hyperparameter. That, that, that might take time. So that's a, you know, that's a, that's the, uh, everything has its positive advantage and disadvantages. And uh, this is the problem we are facing with the deep learning is that uh, perhaps we don't have a very good method so far for estimating the, for uh, estimating the number of, for example, the number of, of, uh, of hidden layers or layers inside the, the artificial neural network. We use three, but uh, we don't know if by using five or 10, we will improve the prediction accuracy. We might improve the prediction accuracy, but if we add another five layers, the computing time will, the advantage on the computing time will collapse. I will be slow in obtaining the results as it is the Bayesian multi of the bio. And uh, so, you know, that's, uh, that's, this is not an easy question to answer. Right, okay. We have a new, new software for Asian multi environment that we publish in, in uh, the plant genome so that people can download it and see. And try. So how easy to really uh, building the G by E for deep learning? It's, uh, it's, not, it's not a big problem. It's not a big problem to build the, the G by E because you, we have the different environments, so we put all the, all the different environments as, as different, you know, as different components of the, of the, of, of the training as well as testing. Set. The thing is that, uh, that perhaps we, you know, perhaps for the deep learning, we don't need to specify the GBI because internally, we think that internally we account for the GBI without having to specify this, that GBI specifically in the model. As we do in the parametric model like GBI. Oh, okay, I see. Uh, we need to study more than that because, because uh, sometimes, we think that if we put the G by E model into the deep learning, we are all competing because we are putting an extra, an extra source of stratification that the deep learning don't need that. That's our feeling, but we need to, we are in the process to see if that is true or not. But has the advantages and, and the implementation is easier. And the, the problem with basically with determined environment is that we are sampling MCMC sampling for a lot of uh, multivariate distributions. So we are sampling all this. We are doing all these iterations in the uh, in the in the map of change, and that that takes time. <coughs> no, no way out. That's why. They, they seem to be a good, uh, a good option for that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah.
So, uh, do you know how much uh, deep learning uh, applied to uh, planned uh, genomic selection or prediction type of research? Oh, wait. Oh, the real, in the real application? You mean in real applications or, or in... So far, we, you know, for wheat and maize, we have used it, but not, not applied for making predictions. We should... We should try that for making predictions at the EYT or EYT or YT level. But uh, I guess we are going to find similar things as we find the GIT lab. Right. We are not going to find anything different, I guess. And uh, we're going to find this. Uh, we are predicting, as Philomen mentioned, we are predicting using YT. We are predicting next year at the level of 0 0.4. So far, 0 0.44 last year. Let's see this year. How is the prediction of the new 10,000 lines, 9,000 lines on the YT using all the previous seven, six years? How it comes? It depends on how how is the year in Oberlin. If the year was normal, without any high temperature in January, I guess the prediction will, they might go up. The marker because Jeffrey has improved the marker quality continuously. Because initially we stuck a prediction accuracy of 0 0.2, then 0 0.3, now it's 0 0.4. So we are moving up the prediction accuracy. Perhaps not much because of data, but the quality of the marker. Sure, sure, definitely. Over time, yeah, your prediction accuracy. Yeah, or, or also, we use pedigree and markers, so we, well, you know, we use the same models, basically the same models that we've been using, but certainly with more data is more chance to, to be able to, to you know, to this, uh, substitute these small haplotypes that throughout the, the cycles they are created. And, uh, but certainly the markers have improved a lot. So we hope we are going to find, we are going to go up to 0 0.5, and then after that, we'll see. But in, each, but in general, when uh, uh, top, the top uh, lines that, uh, that Ravi selected coincide 40, 50% with the top lines we are predicting. So 50% of the best lines that selected or the breeder selected in Oregon, are right, they coincide with the lines, the lines we predict, which is not bad. I think it's not bad. All right, thank you, Dr. Caruso. So anyone else have a question? So Philemon, uh, it's really nice to see uh, you found that the year effect is the key uh, major effect. So yes. do you in the last five years uh, from a different years can be applied to another year if the environment or the weather conditions were similar or planting? Yeah, it's, it's pretty much the environmental conditions. You, it's climatic conditions. It's, it's like one day of very high temperatures can change the entire um, thing what a plant is doing. So, um, and you have so much variation um, in temperatures every year. So that's the biggest uh, effects we have yeah so do you have some wider data like uh, use the uh, apply from like remote sensing or collecting the wider data applied in your model could help the year effect the minimizing the, the big virus? yeah yeah i have been like the process worked a lot and using environmental covariates but the problem with those is they are highly variable even within a year it's within a day so you can take a average of like 10 days and and use them as covariates, but then there's going to be so much of variation even within a day. So it's very hard to to get that whole space of, um, let's say, if it's going to be at 60 days of the crop, it's going to be 25 degrees, and then 70 days it's going to be something else. So it's it's really difficult to get all those effects uh, estimated. What is it? What is the effect of a? What, what does a genotype respond? Different days during the growth. So some crop growth 
that, and that's something that they will be testing in the future. But current, it's very hard to factor in those um, climatic variables. And even if we do that, it's not giving us any significant increase in the accuracies. Is what right, correct. Yeah, just in a quick summary, what would you recommend for a new breeding program if they want to apply genomic selection in their breeding program? Yeah, I would just say, uh, as I mentioned here, also like test your family structures in the populations first. So if you think that genomic selection will have an advantage, there are several lines with, let's say, uh, there are several progenies for each cross. And in earlier generations, if a program can afford to genotype the lines, and because all that we have done is in the advanced line stages, that's why we don't see any um, advantage using GS. But if breeding programs are uh, of a size enough that they can genotype all the early generation material and then uh, test GS there, that might be better. But then again, um, the correlation of grain yields in early generations versus the correlation of grain yields in some of these later generations that they're testing has to be um, has to be again explored. Um, and then yeah, we have small breeding programs that don't have such a big GBAE across the years. Um, then GS might be useful. Uh, one of our um, good things and bad things on. So it's good because we are doing, doing it for multiple um, international sites, but if the target sites are very some breeding programs might have very narrow target sites and where the environments are very similar to testing sites and those conditions, um, GS might help. Okay, yeah. yeah, thank you for the nice summary. Anyone else on the line have question, comments? Okay, if not, let us uh, thank our speakers, Dr. Cross, Jose Croza and the film and Juliana once again. And uh, thank you so much for joining today's webinar. We'll see you uh, next month. Bye now. Thank you very much, Star. Thanks, Star. Thank you.